and welcome back. How's everybody doing? I can't hear you. Um, I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. Um, also, just props to our team here today, making this all happen. So now let me introduce our next speaker. Natural light is an amazing tool that photographers love to use. Today, Roberto is going to teach us how to <laughs> evaluate natural light, or take our natural light game to the greater heights using reflectors, diffusers, and flash techniques. Roberto is an international award-winning wedding and portrait photographer and top-selling author of titles such as Picture Perfect Lighting and Wedding Storytellers Volume 1. He serves as a judge and chairman for the largest photographer print competition in Europe, Mexico, South America, and the Middle East. Roberto's talk is entitled Five Lighting Techniques to Enhance Natural Light. Roberto, the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you, guys. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, I'm going to assume well, you guys can hear me. Yeah, is we everything? can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi guys, welcome uh, Photographers Unite. Thank you so much for putting all of this together. Shout out to every single person watching and thank you so much for your donations for this cause that Daniel and his wife and and uh, Image Alan has been putting together for this, which has been a lot of work. I'll get right to it. I'm Roberto Valenzuela, I'm a Canon Explorer of Light. If you want to follow my Instagram account, uh, it's Roberto underscore photo. And this is gonna be a talk about how to get a little bit more out of natural light by helping it out either with flashes or reflectors or diffusers. Just because I know sometimes it is, um, you know, natural light is a preferred method of working, but a lot of times natural light needs help and light is not always perfect outside. So sometimes you have clouds, rain, sometimes the light's no good, sometimes it's too strong. So I think it'll be good to kind of go over this presentation quickly and give you some pointers on how to make it a little bit better. Number one, I said five techniques, but there will be like eight techniques. But number one, um, something that I learned that was incredibly useful is bringing, bringing a neutral density filter with you. Uh, something around three stops usually does the tricks, the trick. So if you a neutral density filter is a black piece of glass that goes over your lens. And in, in, if you have a Canon EOS R, it's, it, you can have it built in right there. That's what, kind of what it looks like, the thing on the left right there. What it does is if you're shooting in natural light and it's very strong, this will tone down the ambient light and then you use a flash to illuminate your subjects and that you can create a perfect balance between the background being bright and the subjects. You can make the background more neutral and your subjects will actually be brighter than the background by whatever degrees you want you choose. So that to me is an incredible tool to shoot outside you. Basically, no matter what happens, no matter how bright it is, you will be able to control it perfectly and I think that's amazing. And, and, and very useful. Here's an example of that. If you look at this photo, the, the sun and everything was very bright in the background. So what I did is I put a neutral density filter, I toned down the trees in the back, and then I used a flash through a diffuser uh, or a beauty dish actually to illuminate the couple. So you can see the couple is brighter than the background now, but before the background was way brighter than the couple and it just looked like a disaster. Now it looks beautiful. Number two, using a sunlit white wall as the main light source. As you walk around uh, your neighborhood or wherever you're doing shoots, if you see any kind of any kind of wall that's light colored, like tan or white, that's going to be uh, a massive reflector. In order for you to produce the same amount of light with a studio light, you will need like a fifteen thousand dollar modifier. But with buildings and stuff, you can create the same, almost almost the same light without buying anything at all. So this is what it looks like. This is a photograph taken with a white wall right in front of the, of the model or the bride, and I'm standing right in front of her, right behind the wall. So the wall is behind me, the sun is hitting the wall directly, then it's bouncing uh, the light into her. And I think that light is incredibly beautiful, flattering, and I think everybody just loves the way they look uh, with that kind of thing. If they ever wanna take a selfie with you or you wanna take a selfie with anyone, go to a white wall, stand right in front of it and take your selfie and people will like you. Uh, the next one is look for cool shadows from walls. The sun and the building always react like, with walls. So if a building is ne ne next to it and the wall hits that building, it might create a cool shadow or sometimes it creates like a, like geometry or patterns or something fun that you can play with. And you just keep your eye open for these things because they look really cool. And if you can uh, integrate your subject with the cool pattern or geometry that the shadow is making, 
you're creating a very cool composition. For example, this picture here, it's photographed with a building creating a triangular shadow on the wall. So I actually post her with her chin up to the light so she would have flattering light on her face. And then I post her arm in a cool way that it would kind of follow the line of the triangle. So I think it's kind of fun. Here's an example, an example of a pattern. This is my niece Ellie back when she used to be a ballerina. She's not anymore. But you can see the pattern of light hitting the wall. And I thought that's beautiful. And because you keep an eye out for these things and you train your eye to see these things, then you don't miss a beat. So here she is uh, doing a beautiful ballerina pose. And of course, you get the drama of the lines, the shadows and the, and, and the highlights creating multiple lines, basically leading your eye to the shadow. So you start out with the subject getting lit by the sun directly and then the light, light the light on the shot on the wall guides you to the cool shadow on the right side of the composition so it's kind of a fun way to you know enhance both uh the the, the secondary element and the primary element in the photograph here's an example of creating color effects if you have a flash you can get a cheap or a simple uh orange color or, okay or, a, or, or orange color gel or whatever you want to call it um, if you put the orange gel on the flash, then you can actually bring down the Kelvin temperature to something like 3000 or 2800 in natural light, making everything kind of blue. And then you put the CTO uh, in the flash, shoot, shoot the subjects with that orange light. And because your Kelvin temperature is lower, you create this cool color grading kind of effect. Kind of looks like this. This photograph was in Singapore. And you can see how I made the entire city blue by the Kelvin temperature. And then I actually made her pop with an orange glow using a flash and a CTO gel on the flash, which, you know, use that sparingly. I wouldn't use that all the time, but it's kind of a cool effect. And people don't expect a photo because they don't see the, the image in their eyes. It looks very different than what they see in the back of the camera. So it's always a fun shocker when people see that like, oh my gosh, you're crazy, incredible. It's, it's you're not incredible. It's just, a, it's just a little stupid trick, but it, it's kind of fun. But if they want to think you're incredible, that's great. <laughs> the next one is, here's another one photo of my niece. I used the same exact technique. I toned, this was at the Disney concert hall. I toned down everything quite a bit. And then I used a, a CTO, a half CTO to illuminate her, giving her a bit of an orange glow. And I think it looks kind of fun. And it definitely helps you separate them from the background. And it looks really cool. I mean, it looks very cinematic. So you, you can try that whenever you're out in natural light. Um, this is creating daylight when there is no natural light. So if you're kind of shooting when the sun's already down or there's a cloud and it's just, you have that dark blah lighting. Uh, this is something that I, I like to share. It's called flash flaring. At least that's what I called it. I, mean, I, I don't know if there's an official name, but it basically means you point the, you point your flash to the, to the lens of your camera itself. So you don't point it at the subject. You point the flash at the lens. And when you do that, it creates a huge burst of light when the light hits the sensor and it gives you a very cool look. So this example here is a photograph in natural light with where you can obviously see it needs help. This one is with a flash it pointed at the model. So you can see that you, you brought her up, but the background still looks dark. And then this next photo is using the flash flare. So we pointed the flash from her face to the lens and you create this look, which looks pretty incredible considering it was taken 10 seconds after the first two photos I just showed you. So I think that's a really cool technique you can try. It's called flash flaring, point the flash to the lens, and it will take some trial and error with power, but if you balance it, you can get something like this. The next one is using a diffuser as the light source to enhance nat to enhance natural light. This is probably one of the most used techniques I use in my repertoire because it's so easy to do and lightweight. Everyone has a, a collapsible diffuser, so just pop it out. Here's, your, here's my subject. Cool guy, cool suit, but lighting's terrible. So we brought in my flashes and then you have a diffuser. You put the diffuser very close to the subject's face to create soft, flattering light. The flash fires, illuminates the entire diffuser, creating, creating a very flattering, beautiful, large light source, giving you that kind of result. And the result of that is, look at the photo on the right compared to the photo on the left. It is night and day. And you can do this in five seconds. It doesn't require anything, just a flash and a diffuser, which we all have. This is uh, a black and white version of that, but you already saw the color. Here's the same thing. Uh, this was in Switzerland and we have a beautiful girl, but we've ran out of light like we always do. So instead of giving up and packing your, your gear, we brought a diffuser again to illuminate the front of her. So we put a flash with the diffuser, the flash fires, the diffuser illuminates, and that creates a soft flattering light illuminating the front of her face. 
And then to separate her from the background, because they're both dark, the, the leaves and the hair, we used a flash, bare bulb, we lowered the power to bare minimum, and we just illuminated the back of her hair. As you can see, there's my friend, um, Mariana doing, Marian doing it with a flash in the back. And this is the final result that you get, and you get a beautiful separation between the hair, the background, and now the front of her face looks really nice, and she's she was very surprised because she did not expect such poor lighting to look so beautiful at the end. Um, the last one I would say is uh, directing the light where needed. So in in this case, this is probably one of the one of the fun, most fun techniques that I used in weddings. In wedding photography, a lot of times we have um, we have these rooms and we have the light coming from the window or whatever you're having light from, and the light illuminates the bride and she looks gorgeous. But then after the bride, like any any inches after the bride, it basically goes into complete darkness and it doesn't look very flattering. Um, even if you have the bride alone, sometimes it just she just looks kind of dark, like the rest of the composition looks very dark. Uh, because the light cannot reach the back of the room. But when you have other bridesmaids or mom and dad or anything like that, and they are behind the bride, which means further away from the window, you end up with them looking very dark. And then you have the bride looking perfect. The parents or the bridesmaids look completely dark. And to me, that doesn't look very professional. So to fix that issue, we, um, we point a reflector and you point the reflector with a flash. So somebody has a flash and a reflector and they're holding it at the same time. And then you point the reflector to the people that need the light. So you don't point it to the bride because the bride is already lit You're by the window light. You point it to the people that are farthest from the window. And then you, of course, you do this on manual flash. And then you down, you dial the power down or up to whatever you want it to be. You have to be realistic about it. You cannot put the power too bright so the people in the the people behind uh, the bride as farthest away from the window could not possibly be brighter than the bride getting lit by the window, obviously. So you point the, the sun illuminates the bride through the window and she looks great and she's the she's beautiful and she's the brightest subject. Then you point a flash through a reflector, you bounce the light from the reflector to the people that need it the most, and then you dial it down to make it look realistic. And the result, as you can see in the photo, the result looks like this, which looks a little bit like a painting, but it still has a realistic feel to the photograph. But you can see that there is nice light. Even the girl on the left, you can still see the details in her dress and in her arm and in her earrings. And I dialed it down quite a bit to make it look realistic. That was one mistake I made a long time ago is trying to create more lights because I had it and it didn't look good. So I learned to chill out, relax, get the light, point it, and then dial it way down. And it's still gonna be much better than if you didn't have the flash bouncing against the reflector, okay? Uh, now, why do I use a reflector instead of a wall during this particular thing? I learned from experience trying and making mistakes and failing and trying again, that if you point the flash behind you, like, like the wall behind me, if you point the flash behind and then the wall bounces the light towards your subjects, that is going to illuminate the entire room pretty much almost evenly. So that doesn't create, that doesn't separate them from the wall behind them. So in order to create separation between them and the wall behind them, you use a smaller light source that's closer to them. So a reflector is closer to them. So when the light hits the reflector, then the reflector becomes the light source and it illuminates the people closest to the reflector. So it's gonna be the bridesmaids. They're there, therefore the light will hit them brighter than the wall behind the bridesmaids. If you, if you, um, if you do use this technique, you will see it very clearly that when you hit the bridesmaids, they're gonna be brighter and then the wall will be darker, making them pop. That is what gives you that painting feel to the photograph. But if you use a wall and you bounce the light to that, it just blows light all over the room and it doesn't look very flattering or painter painterly at all. Um, so that's it. Uh, I, I, I wanted to let you guys know if you guys are still interested, uh, anyone still wanting to get together with people, but we are doing 
my photo creators lighting conference is still going to be held in Tucson, Arizona. You can go to the photocreators.com and I'm giving everyone $300 off because people are scared to travel. But that's not, it's going to be no, not till November 2nd and 5th. It's going to be four lighting instructors coming from all over the world. And we're going to be teaching lighting only in this conference. So it should be really fun. Thank you guys for coming to my little class. And thank you so much to Image Salon for putting this incredible uh, online conference together. And thank you for everyone listening and donating their money for charity in a time of need. If there's any questions, I, I can answer now. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is a two-part question. Um, they ask, when are you planning to publish your next book? And do you plan to write a book on teaching guitar? <laughs> what? <laughs> teaching guitar? <laughs> I just read the questions. <laughs> I was not expecting that, I'll tell you, man. Um, I just finished my latest book, which is my sixth book. Uh, I finished it two weeks ago, so now we're actually in the final stages of layout, and then it will be published all over the world probably two months from today or a month and a half from today. It's going into press. This book is going to be called The Successful Professional Photographer, and it is a book based not only on my experience building an entire business from scratch in portrait and wedding photography in three different parts of the United States, but also I included my entire knowledge base on my business degrees in, at the University of Arizona where, where I studied consumer behavior, and that teaches you how to deal with people's behavior, how to understand their behavior, so they will buy what you're selling without having to fight them on discounts and you can upsell without sounding like a, like a used car salesman. It's a lot of psychology in the book. The book is mainly to help you understand how to enter your client's head and be able to cater to them specifically. And I think it will be a very successful book for people trying to actually make money as a photographer. So this book is not for the enthusiast or for the hobbyist. This book is truly meant for people that are trying to make a living and trying to make a real living wage in photography uh, in the portrait and the wedding world. And that's what the book is about. I'm very excited about that. It's been a lot of work, two years writing it. The guitar book will never come out because I, I am a terrible guitar player these days. I cannot even um, I cannot even imagine how much the guitarists in the world will laugh at me if I put out a book on guitar teaching. I did used to teach guitar for 10 years, but that was a different lifetime ago. And now I'm just a terrible guitar player. Uh, I'd buy the book. Okay, uh, next question. Well, you're <laughs> um, tips on starting out with Flash. What mode should it be on? Um, yeah, what like what settings would you use, and like what mode would you set the Flash to? I think putting your Flash on the on the on the default, which is TTL or through the lens. I think that's actually what causes the most confusion when you're trying to learn Flash, because the Flash behaves inconsistently depending on where you point the Flash to. So if you want to understand flash, forget TTL, put it on manual and simply dial it down. If you need less light, dial it up. If you need more light, everyone can understand that Buy a real flash. I really suggest you buy a real branded flash Buy a Nikon, a Sony, a, a Canon, a Panasonic, buy a flash that's made by the company that makes your camera. Don't buy the Chinese knockoffs because they break. I teach my lighting workshop in Tucson and they pretty much 90% of those flashes bust, right? If, if the weather goes over 82 degrees, the internals of those flashes bust. And if you're getting paid to do a job, you shouldn't go into a job using knockoff gear. Just, just get the real deal. You, you'll be happy. You'll be happy with it. Take it off TTL, put it on manual, learn it that way, and then start venturing into TTL later. But I never use TTL. Nice. And... With some of your techniques, would, like, do they require an assistant to make happen, or how do you go about it? You definitely need an assistant, and I don't suggest you ever do a shoot without one. Simply get a high school student, pay them 100 bucks, and let them come with you and help you hold the reflector. It's not hard. Uh, there's a lot of people that are interested in learning photography, and they love it, and they're getting into it. So it shouldn't be hard for you to find someone that will do it for free, or just pay them a minimal amount to come with you and hold the light. Ha um, having an assistant actually allows you to hold an LED light, a flash, a reflector, a diffuser, and completely enhance the lighting that your subjects are paying for, your clients are paying for. And I think if, as, as 
as soon as there is money being exchanged, you need to up your game. If you're gonna call yourself a professional photographer, then up your game a little and give them something professional, something extra. And I think you owe it to them to have a little bit of an extra boost in composition, posing and lighting, and bringing an assistant will definitely make that happen. Not to mention, if you get hurt at a wedding and you sprain your ankle, then who's gonna take over? So it's kind of a responsible thing just to bring someone with you anyway. Nice. Um, and what would be kind of your advice on like testing out the techniques or kind of practicing them and like drilling them so you're comfortable with them when it comes time to use them in a shoot? I think one of the techniques that's more fun to um, practice is everyone, everyone, at, everyone in their homes has a window. So grab your dog, your daughter, your son, your uncle, your, your, your mom, and put them in the same place where a bride would or a portrait, if you're doing natural light portraits, put them about a foot from the window or something, and then do the reflector, flash against the reflector technique, and see if you can illuminate like something behind them. So put, put a family member a foot from the window and then put some, some, somebody else maybe six feet from the window, and then try to put more light on the person that's six feet away from the window and then dial it up and down. Um, if you don't have people that you can you can ask them to do that because they, they will hate you for asking them, go to the store, buy some uh, cantaloupes or some bananas, put the bananas on a light stand because the bananas, re uh, they uh, resemble like skin on human skin. So it's actually a very similar, uh, the light will behave on a, on a banana very similar. So grab out some bananas they're pretty much 99 cents or get some rotten ones for 59 cents put them on the light stand put another set of bananas six feet away and try to illuminate the the furthest bananas uh, a little bit less than the bananas on the front of the window that's awesome i think um that tip right <laughs> there is actually going to take my photography to the next level because i feel <laughs> weird asking people to stand there like let me practice taking awful photographs of them um, yeah, nobody wants to help, but bananas don't have a choice, so. Exactly, and then you get to eat them after, ayo. Uh, yeah. But yeah, thank you so much for making the time and for being a part of this, and yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, exactly. Thank you so much for doing behind the scenes as well. Thank you guys for listening. We'll see you soon. For sure, take care. Thanks, bye. Okay, so now we're going to take a break. It's going to be a slightly longer break. About 10 minutes, eight minutes, eight, eight minutes now, counting down each second. And then we'll come back with our next speaker, Elena Blair.